Love, we all need it. We sing songs about it, and we devote much of our lives to pursuing it. We were made for love, and we live longer, healthier, and happier lives when we both receive love and readily give it away. Yet, in our world, love often seems in short supply. Perhaps this is why Jesus spent so much time modeling it for us. The truth is, love matters. It has the power to enrich our lives, transform our relationships, and change the world. Love really is the answer. Around the time that I graduated from high school, there was a song called Graduation by an artist named Vitamin C. It's not the song that we started worship with this morning, uh, but it's a song that tells the story of an artist who's graduating high school and wondering what the rest of their life will look like. At the beginning of the song, it says, and so we talked all night about the rest of our lives. Where are we going to be when we turn 25? I keep thinking things will never change. Keep on thinking things will always be the same. And then as the song continues, the artist realizes that everything in life changes. The well-known rhythms of high school have finished, and before them are new horizons. Graduation marks not only an ending, but a beginning. And then the catchy chorus comes along, and that says, as we go on, we remember all the times we had together, and as our lives change, come whatever, we will be friends forever. Some of you are going to have this song stuck in your head the rest of the day. I don't know if I'm apologizing or, or just offering it to you as a gift. This was super popular. So this played at all of our high school graduation parties. My high school had the practice where the seniors in choir would sing a song during the ceremony, and this is what we sang. We had smiles on our faces, tears in our eyes. We held each other's hands, and we sang this song of hope and memory. I found this week a picture from my high school graduation. I'm second from the left. These are my very best friends, my people, all through junior high and high school. In the 20 plus years since, I have lost touch with some of them, but a couple of them are still my best friends, and one of them is even a pastor in Minnesota in the Methodist Church. So she's not only one of my best friends and a kind of sister, but also a treasured, treasured colleague. On that day, we were hopeful and excited. We were confident of our dreams for the future and what that would hold, but we were also pretty terrified. We had no idea how to be adults in the big world. We all prepared to move on to different cities and colleges and careers. And I imagine that our graduates today feel a lot like we did then. This mix of emotions of being hopeful and terrified, excited and unsure of what the future holds. Now, for some of us, this experience of high school graduation is nearer to today than others, but all of us know what it is to stand on the edge of something new, to be on the horizon of beginning a new thing, and to ask yourself, what now? How is it that I will make my way in the world? How am I to live and to move and to be? I suggest to you that when this time happens, that you reflect and you think about the words and the actions of Jesus. What might Jesus tell us about this experience and transition in our life? And so if we look to scripture, we can see that Jesus offers many words of wisdom and instructions to his followers, but they really begin to amp up toward the end of his ministry. Jesus knew that his death and his resurrection would be this turning point. There would be a distinct before and after in the life of all those who followed him. And so the ending of John's gospel, we have this whole section which we call the farewell discourse. And it's filled with teachings and lessons that Jesus is offering his disciples, trying to answer that question, what now? How do we live and make our way in the world? You see, the disciples were in the middle of a season of transition in their life too. They just didn't realize it yet. And so I think it's particularly helpful when we are in times of change or times of transition in our life to look to this part of scripture and to see how Jesus encouraged his followers. So in John 15, which we read this morning, we hear this. You didn't choose me, remember? I chose you and put you into the world to bear fruit. As fruit bearers, whatever you ask the Father in relation to me, God gives you. 
but remember the root command, love one another. So the first thing that I notice as I read here is Jesus reminding us that we belong. You didn't choose me, I chose you. And so the first way that we might approach any season of change or transition is to remember our belonging in Christ. To remember that there is nothing that we can do about it, but we belong to Christ who loves us. As Americans, I think we live our lives under two general beliefs, myths actually. First, that our successes or our failures define us. And secondly, that whether we succeed or fail is all on us. Both are wrong, of course. But this passage and others like it remind us that we are defined as a beloved child of God. You are, at your core, someone who is loved and is worthy of being loved, no matter what. You have nothing to prove. Your value and your worth in life is not contingent on how many followers you have, on what the GPA on your transcript is, on what your title is at work. As we discussed a couple weeks ago, these are supporting actors in our lives, but they are not your main work. What is most important is that you have been created in love and called to love. And before you have done anything, Jesus has already declared you his own. This is your DNA. It's not contingent on your successes or your accomplishments. It does not disappear when you forget or fail or flounder. God's love is not something that wears off or washes away. It does not ebb or flow. It is yours. You are God's chosen one. This means that the core of who you are is fully loved by God. Often our world tries to make us small, tries to convince us that we need to buy something or do something or change something to be loved or valued. But Jesus says, no, I choose you and I love you. This means that, that all of you belongs and is loved by God. Your passions, your interests, the things that bring you joy, the beautiful spectrum of neurodiversities and gender expressions, our differing abilities within our bodies and brains, the fullness of how God has created us to love one another, gay and straight, single and married, widowed and divorced, the beautiful shape of your body, the color of your skin, the way your hair curls and moves around your shoulders, even if you have no hair at all, the wrinkles of wisdom upon your face, the glow of youth around your eyes, whether you are happy or cranky, confident or doubting. Do you hear what I'm saying? All of you, every piece of you is loved by God. Your whole self, not just a piece of you, not just a portion of you, not when you are ready or perfect or get it all right, but right now, God says, I choose you and I love you. And when Jesus knew that he had just a limited amount of time left with his disciples, and he was trying to cram in all those final words of wisdom and blessing, the parents of our graduates know this, you're trying to figure out how you've got just a few months left and what you can say to them, this is what Jesus decided to say. I choose you and I love you. In the same passage in John 15, he says this, I've told you these things for a purpose, that my joy might be your joy. And your joy, wholly mature, this is my command, love one another the way I loved you. This is the very best way to love. Put your life on the line for your friends. You are my friends. Jesus has shown us the fullness of that love by putting down his own life, sacrificing his own life so that we might know abundance and joy. And just as every beautiful piece of you is made in God's image and chosen by Christ, so too is that true for everyone around us. Those sitting next to you in worship right now, your new roommate at university, the neighbor down the street, even that person you have yet to meet that acts or looks or behaves or believes differently than you. Jesus' final words to his disciples in the middle of a whole lot of change and transition is to love one another. Love as I have loved you. 
And so today we're going to pass along this same advice, not only to our high school graduates, but to all of us as we're trying to figure out how to, how to live and breathe and move in our world. Whenever you're experiencing transition or change, if ever you are looking for greater peace and joy, remember these words, love one another. This is simple to say and difficult to live. And so how might we make up some best practices? I want to encourage you to remember these four simple letters, WWJD. And you're welcome to some of you of a certain age. I just got that stuck in your head now, too, and you are experiencing a major flashback. Because when we were growing up in the 90s, all of us had these woven bracelets on our wrists. You remember them. They're woven, they said WWJD on them. We exchanged them today like Taylor Swift fans exchanged their friendship bracelets. They were a sign to the world and a reminder to ourselves of who we belonged. They were a witness on our wrist, testifying to the love of Jesus in our life and in the world. Plus, they were pretty cool, right? Mm -hmm. I wore my bracelet for years. Every day I wore it to school, I wore it to tennis matches, to Bible camp, to the little restaurant where I worked. Everywhere I went, I carried this bracelet, WWJD. It was a tangible reminder and invitation to ground myself on the story and the, and the teachings and the love of Jesus. Now, as it happens, I figured that I couldn't have a message called WWJD without offering you a gift of bracelets today. So as you make your way out of worship, there are baskets of bracelets, uh, both woven ones like we, that were popular several decades ago, and some beaded ones that look like the Swifty friendship bracelets. So grab one or two yourself, and as you take them with you, I want them to be for you a tangible reminder of Jesus' words, I choose you, I love you. And as you make your way in the world, as you're trying to figure out what to say and what to do and what to act, we can look upon them and remember. Now, when Jesus gave these instructions to his disciples to love as you have been loved, he didn't then give explicit instructions for what that meant. He relied on the disciples' ability to know to remember his ministry, his teachings, his healings, and to see that Jesus had been teaching them how to love all along. And so we are invited to do the same thing. As I look over Jesus, the whole of his ministry, there are three things that stand out to me that I think are just overarching ways to live. And I want to invite you um, to consider these as you make your way in the world. They are that Jesus lived by being welcoming to all, being generous in his spirit, and being quick to forgive. And so first, we'll talk about being welcoming. This is one of the most central characteristics of Jesus' ministry. It also is one of the biggest criticisms of his ministry. People thought that he was too welcoming. He was constantly meeting new people, making new friends, and inviting them into community. But he didn't just stick to the people that, that were expected. He didn't surround himself with only people from his hometown or only people who had studied religion like he had or only people who had already committed to following him. Jesus invited anyone and everyone to join in, fishermen and tax collectors and women and people who had been pushed aside and forgotten and harmed and marginalized. He spent all kinds of time with the wrong people and he looked them in the eye. He shared a word of blessing, invited them to the table, and gave them a voice. Jesus was always assuming this posture of welcome. And we can learn from this too, whether we're brand new on a college campus or, and finding our footing there, or we're comfortable in our spaces near to home. We too can take this posture of welcome. We can seek out those who are sitting alone in a lecture hall or came to worship by themselves. We can smile at somebody who's new in the neighborhood and maybe uh, introduce ourselves. When we do, we will find that our love grows, our lives change, and we experience Christ's love within us. Secondly, Jesus models a heart of generosity. A few weeks ago, I presided over a funeral here and one of the sons gave a eulogy. And in that eulogy, he, he, he told this story about his dad. He said, my dad was one of the most generous people you've ever met. You'd go to him and say, dad, can I ask you a favor? And immediately, sure, what do you need? Before you could even say what the favor was, dad had already agreed to it. 
And this experience and story has stuck with me because I think that's exactly the kind of spirit of generosity that Jesus invites us into. Before a need is even raised up completely, sure, what do you need? When Jesus says, love as I have loved you, he's saying be generous with one another, care for one another deeply, help one another when you can, support each other with your presence and your words and your actions and your gifts. And I also think about the ways that Jesus assumed the best in others, He was generous to their whole self. When he met Zacchaeus, he didn't grill him about his behaviors or actions. He invited him to a meal. When Jesus had asked Peter to walk on water and then Peter sunk, Jesus didn't give a lecture on trust. He reached out his arms and caught him. And when we think about all the miracles of Jesus, he didn't transform just enough bread and fish to feed the people. There were 12 baskets left over. He didn't transform just enough water to wine to make it through the reception. He transformed the best wine with plenty to spare. Jesus is generous with his love in every definition and way. How is it that we can be generous to one another? Might we allow the car who is late to merge a little grace? That's hard for some of us. Might we assume that the person seeking assistance is in genuine need? Might we look at the neighbor or stranger or a friend and see them fully as a beloved child of God, redirect ourselves and, and align ourselves with generosity and grace? And then lastly, of course, I think all of Jesus' teachings and ministry are surrounded um, by his efforts to forgive. Maybe more than anything else, forgiveness shows us what love is. Because forgiveness doesn't demand perfection. It does not tie strings to love. You'll remember in 1 Corinthians 13, we're told love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. Love does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered and keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love cannot be any of these things unless we also have forgiveness. Jesus loved us fully by offering us complete forgiveness. When we mess up, when we forget, when we falter and go go astray, Jesus forgives This is how we heal and strengthen our relationships. It's in our ability to name and know our own brokenness, to see the brokenness in one another, and to love them anyway. In every situation and transition, Jesus models for us a love that is welcoming and generous and forgiving. And so when you wonder how to make your way in the world, how to act or speak or move, I want you to think, perhaps look upon your wrist, what would Jesus do? And then remember, Jesus chooses you, Jesus loves you, and Jesus shows you this love by being welcoming and generous and forgiving. This is my prayer and hope for all of us, to our graduates and to those of us where graduation is a distant, faint memory that we might be united, that we might find harmony in Christ, that these words and wisdom can, can be the guide for our life, that you may know them, you may trust them, you may believe them. Beloved, love one another as I have loved you. Let us pray. Holy God, surround us by your love today. When we are feeling anxious, doubtful, nervous, or proud, bring to us your peace. When we are feeling overwhelmed, cast aside, or not enough, remind us that we are yours. You have sent us into the world to be signs of your love. Make it be so, dear God. Make us vessels of your love. Make us welcoming, generous, forgiving, and kind that our whole lives bear fruit of your goodness. And all your people say, Amen.